A Sisi victory is expected as Egypt wraps up elections. Will the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation strengthen ties between China and the continent? And African players make their mark in college basketball. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. Egyptian officials say a firebomb attack on a Cairo night, nightclub killed 16 people early Friday. Investigators say it was an attack by a disgruntled former employee. They say the man has had hurled a Molotov, Molotov cocktail into the restaurant after an argument. The victims were burned to death or died from smoke inhalation at the restaurant. Also, a nightclub was located in a basement offering no escape route. A search is underway for the attacker. Well, Egypt uh, wrapped up its parliamentary election Wednesday and results are expected to show a win for supporters of President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. Some analysts, however, say widespread vote buying, low turnout and other irregularities could later be used as reasons uh, to dissolve the lawmaking body. VOA Heather Maddock has more from Cairo. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi was not running for anything in this election, but he is expected to emerge the winner with a body of legislators who will support him and the roughly 200 laws he has passed by decree. Despite the low turnout, election workers say they are excited because the country has been without a parliament for about three years. I love my homeland. I, I love Egypt. Egypt. I hope the right candidate will win. I hope all the candidates will win, including myself. Some observers say Egypt's elections were marred by vote buying, officials directing voters, as well as turnout that appeared to be the lowest since before the 2011 ouster of Hosni Mubarak. Some of the candidates are trying to win votes with bribes, and it is changing which candidates they are voting for. Other observers say vote buying in Egypt is so common these days, it functions like a large business. Buying votes has become like the stock market. The morning opens with one price, and in the afternoon, it's higher price. The highest prices are just before the polling stations close. Egypt's last parliament was dissolved in 2012, and observers say the irregularities at the polls could later be used to break up this nearly 600-member body. The incoming parliament is the first elected since the adoption last year of a new constitution that empowers lawmakers to impeach a president or call for early elections. In the meantime, the new parliament is expected to start work next month. Heather Murdoch, VOA News, Cairo. Well, from, from north to south, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping told African leaders on Friday his country would provide $60 billion for development projects, cancel some debt and boost agriculture over the next three years in the continent. Now, Xi was speaking at the opening of the China-Africa Summit in Johannesburg. Xi, who is co-chairing the forum, outlined a broad 10-point development plan driven by the Asian economic giant, saying he wanted to build a relationship of equals. Now, for some insights, Eric Chin, Chief Executive Officer of the African Media Initiative, joins me live via phone from Nairobi. Eric, welcome to Africa 54. Um, thank you very much, Vincent. Now, pleasure to be here. Yes, I know you just uh, came back from that conference. Uh, give us a sense of uh, what the $60 billion can really do for Africa. Well, you know, it'll depend a lot on what Africa wants to do for itself. And uh, uh, the Chinese are not in a losing game here. They're here to uh, hopefully mutually um, uh, find uh, opportunities for China and you know, in the process, help in building Africa. Now, it's, um, it's unclear what exactly the Africans are looking at. I mean, is it just the money, or they're actually looking at uh, projects that have been uh, defined, have been refined, and can be them? It's not clear what's coming up yeah, now, on the African side. I think, yeah. now, Eric, you know, this uh, relationship has uh, been suspicious for, from some quarters. Uh, some have felt that China is actually gaining much more, but China says they want to build a relationship of equals. What is your assessment? Well, first of all, you might have said, um, Carlos looked at say recently that um, all of China's investments in Africa account for less than 1% of its 
global um, global investment. So this is a, a drop in the bucket for China. But for Africa, it could mean a whole lot. But it would on the east. As I said earlier, Africans know what it is they want. I don't think, I still do, do not see an African agenda. I do not see uh, projects, railroads, um, um, highways and byways that will help in building the African economy. I do not see any plan by African countries to radically transform their own economy, especially the commodity-dependent economy of the likes of Zambia, for example. They still have not been able when prices were high, to diversify that economy. There's nothing China can do. Not $60 billion from China to Zambia alone will make a difference. Yeah. Uh, very quickly, as an African Media Initiative CEO, uh, what, what is your interest in media and China? Well, um, first of all, we, you know, we had a, a, a kind of a China-Africa summit on the sidelines of this event. And um, from my perspective, uh, there's a need for a couple of things. One, for both countries to know, uh, for both parts of the, uh, of the equation, you know, Africa on the one hand, um, China on the other, for both to know each other better. So um, in, in that regard, media can do a whole lot. Um, we, need, we need to strengthen African media in many ways, um, both in terms of the technology, in terms of its capacity, in terms of its access to resources, uh, we need to strengthen all of that, and um, I, in my discussions, I'm not mm -hmm. totally certain that okay. that's part of China's agenda, but that's something we've got to give. Okay. We've got to impose that. Yeah, definitely, and we'll talk a little more about that some other time. Eric, thank you very much. Eric Chinja, Chief Executive Officer, African Media Initiative. Well, Amnesty International says some European countries are rejecting asylum applications from Eritrean refugees. That is despite evidence that they face imprisonment and torture if they are forcibly returned to the country. Henry Ridgewell reports from London. Eritreans are the third largest group of refugees arriving on Europe's shores after Syrians and Afghans. Stefan Simanowicz of Amnesty International says the vast majority are young men fleeing oppressive national service. Children from the ages of 17, 16 are forced into conscription. It's meant to last 18 months, but in reality can go on for indefinite periods. We spoke to people who had left after being in conscription in national service for 10, 15 years. A UN Commission of Inquiry earlier this year described Eritrea as one of the world's most oppressive regimes. The Eritrean government denied the report's accusations. Amnesty says the conscription amounts to forced labor and anyone trying to evade or escape faces dire consequences. If they are spit seen or caught, they can be shot and killed, they can be arrested, they can be tortured. Many of them are locked up in cells, underground cells or in shipping containers for long periods as punishment for trying to avoid conscription. Simanowicz says the same fate would likely face Eritrean refugees forcibly returned from Europe or elsewhere. Yet some European countries, including Britain and Denmark, have begun rejecting most Eritrean asylum applications. The British government changed its policy in March, claiming Eritrea is safe for migrants to return to after leaving illegally. The situation for Eritrean asylum seekers is a desperate one and they must be given safe haven. The exodus of young refugees from Eritrea was high on the agenda at last month's EU-Africa Migration Summit in Malta. We need to put maximum pressure on Eritrea because what is happening is extremely serious. Nobody is talking about it. It is a country that is becoming empty of its own population. Eritreans who had been granted asylum were among the first refugees to be relocated from Germany to Spain under the European Union's new migrant plan. Each European country sets its own rules on asylum. Henry Richwell for VOA News, London.
Central Cameroon's army, backed by a regional task force, has killed at least 100 members of the militant Islamist Boko Haram group and freed 900 people it had held hostage. The Cameroon Minister for Information, Esa Chiroma Bakari, said troops had conducted a sweep operation between November 26 and 28 along Cameroon's long border with its western neighbor, Nigeria. It was not immediately clear where the clashes with the militants had taken place or where Boko Haram's captives had been held. Meanwhile, Nigeria's Senate is discussing a draft bill which aims to banish anyone who propagates false information on electronic media. Many Nigerians have been expressing their anger with tweets using the hashtag not, uh, not to social uh, media bill to campaign against the proposal. Now for more on what is happening in and around Nigeria, I'm joined by Andrew Palcheski, VOA's social media engagement analyst, and Ali Mustafa, managing editor, House of Service. Gentlemen, welcome to Africa 54. Thanks. Thank Mr. you. Now let's begin with this report uh, from uh, Cameroon, or the border area between Cameroon and Nigeria. What more do you know about this operation and about what has happened to those 900 rescued people? Well, what we know so far, Vincent, is that this incident took place about three, four days ago in what they call far north, uh, northern Cameroon section of the country. And um, as you indicated, um, over 100 Boko Haram militants were killed and uh, close to 1,000 people were rescued. Um, what I think is significant in this incident is that uh, Boko Haram is slowly but surely expanding its operations. It's been in those parts of uh, Africa already, but it's beginning to shift focus and attention away from Nigeria. There hasn't been any major mm -hmm. coordinated Boko Haram attack in Nigeria. Is, is it because they're being squeezed hard or is it that they just want to expand? Well, you know, uh, President Mahmoud Buhari has set a December deadline yeah, to yeah. defeat Boko Haram. And yeah. uh, the big question on everybody's lives in Nigeria is, will this be achieved? The fact that Boko Haram has been unable or unwilling mm -hmm. to conduct any major coordinated operations in Nigeria and is instead venturing out yeah. is giving the indication that it might be working, that, that 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 effort on the part of the Nigerian government might be paying dividends. Now, uh, Andrew, in, let's switch gears here and talk about social media. What do you make of this? What is behind this bill? The fascinating thing about this is that had the government maybe done this a little quieter and hadn't put out this bill, it might not have gotten the social media reaction. But by putting out this bill, they kind of set off this global response. And it isn't just in Nigeria. It's across Africa and around the world yeah. that people are using that hashtag, hashtag no to social media bill. A lot of people saying, don't they have anything better to do? Of course, exactly. with Boko Haram, there are other issues that they say are more pressing. Other people saying, how are they going to enforce this? They're saying yeah. people aren't allowed to use text messages to send these things. How are they going to monitor that? And does this lead to an invasion on free speech? Yeah. And, and, and again, there's that ambiguity about uh, the, what they call false information. What is false information? Exactly. There's a lot of questions about yeah. how they would enforce this, what those words mean. And a lot of people are just really concerned that uh, the government is going to invade into their social media, invade into their free speech. And in other instances where this has happened in other countries, we've seen similar responses. So it's really not a surprise that the people are striking back. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the power of the people ended up winning at the end of the day. Yes. Very quickly, uh, Aliu, given the kind of goodwill uh, that uh, Mr. Buhari has received so far, could this be a kind of a negative to his government or this is seen isolatedly you know as a the social Senate media thing, thing? yes uh, well you know in nigeria they are saying the the lawmakers are personally affected by the effect of the social media and that is why it is uh, they are taking this action in particular they point out to certain senators within the national assembly yeah. who have been victims of the social media so the, it's personal and uh, people are beginning to think this is personal yeah. and uh, the big question is how do you even enforce yes. such a bill yes. um, uh, there have been such attempts in places like yeah. niger but what they did was not to introduce bills they just jammed to the social media and just made it impossible for people Andrew, to can anybody okay. really stop social media I, I don't think so i think this is evidence that you can't uh, yeah. and one of the, my favorite tweets that i saw yeah. somebody said if you don't have thick skin and you can't take the criticism don't go into politics exactly <laughs> so they better just stay either stay away from politics or stay clean exactly i think so exactly right. you know gentlemen andrew leo uh, thank you very much uh, for coming in and giving some of your uh, this insights on this issue. Thank you very much. Well, Andrew uh, Polcheski is a social media engagement analyst and Aliyah Mustafa is managing editor, House of Service.
Well, we want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Well, coming up now in our Music Makers segment, a uh, closer look at uh, Malawian artist Gaspar Nali. Stay with us. Welcome back, it's Music Makers Friday, and today we take you to Malawi. Our featured artist is Gaspar Nali with the song Abale Ndikuzeni. For more about the artist, I'm joined by Music Time in Africa host, Heather Maxwell. Heather, welcome back. Hi, thank you, Vincent. This guy is interesting. He really is interesting. Yeah. You know, he makes that instrument. A fascinating instrument. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a one-string bass guitar yeah. and bass drum all combined into one. Makes this instrument, plays the instrument, mm -hmm. and sings. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this beautiful song that is almost a tank twister. Yeah, I can't and say Bali it. Don't ask me to say into Kuizeni. <laughs> Let's watch it, yeah. and then we can talk about it. You know, earlier, I remember I told you, it's, it's so pure to me and really a joyous thing. I think so too. Yeah. I think it's, um, it's special and actually a lot of people do because, yeah. you know, this song was recorded and the video was yeah. made five years ago, uh -huh. but just recently it got discovered on YouTube and now it's gone viral. Uh -huh. uh, about 17 million views of this music yeah. video. Because it's a true musician. I mean, it's not like some guy making some noise and people are generating yeah. uh, some, some beats in yes. the background. Yes. He does this all, all the way from yeah. making that instrument. It's really organic. Yeah. I don't know. What's the name of the instrument? Do we know? Yeah, Baba Tony. Baba Tony, that's the, the name Baba of this Tony. instrument. Yes. Is this something that other people have perhaps used or is it something? That it, appears to be just. I believe his it's own something thing. that he invented. He has invented this. Yes. And I think it should go big. I think hopefully. so too. I want to bring Maybe one back. Maybe something we bring one over here. That'd be nice. Yeah. And then. Um, yeah, maybe, are you going to try and talk to this guy? I will try to. He, yeah. he, this song is one of yeah. um, several that he's yeah. releasing this month in December yeah. Yeah. on his new album. Yeah. So um, people okay. can look Hopefully. out for that. Once that comes out, I'll yeah. interview him and, yeah. and find out more. That would be nice. It would be yeah. nice to know about this guy. I like him. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Heather. My pleasure. Yeah. And now for uh, more, uh, or rather for, uh, to learn more about uh, talent, the talented Heather Maxwell herself <laughs> and her VOA show Music Time in Africa, visit Facebook and type in the keywords Heather Maxwell 
And you can also uh, see what time a radio program can be heard in your area. Get more information about some of our featured artists. Thank you very much. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. African players shoot for their dreams on the basketball court. We'll be right back. back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. Superheroes battle it out in new Batman 5 Superman trailer. In the final scene of the trailer, there is an appearance from Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman, completing the superhero trinity. Now the movie comes three years after a Cavill first graced the screens of Superman in Man of Steel and fans await Ben Affleck's first outing as Batman with anticipation. Now the film is set to open in the U.S. on March 25th, 2016. Well, next up, uh, for four hours every day, for a hundred days, Chinese artist Wang Rengzeng held up the suction head of an industrial vacuum cleaner to suck in polluted air at Beijing's uh, various landmark site. Now the artist hopes his performance art, dubbed as the DAS project, can highlight the issues of air pollution to the Chinese public. Local media reports of Wang's performance, are, uh, uh, rather art, went uh, viral this week with the news that dust pollutants included that it had collected from 400 hours of vacuuming uh, Beijing air was being made into a regular size brick. And other pollutants, uh, rather pollution spike is a reminder of China's severe environmental challenges. Well, and finally, people in London look uh, the most miserable in their selfies, while strong smiles are found in Sao Paulo and Bangkok, says a research involved in setting up a London show about selfies. For its new exhibition, uh, Big Bang Data, uh, Somerset House has commissioned Selfie City London, a spotlight on 640 selfies selected out of over 100,000 public Instagram images taken in a single week in September. On a touch screen, visitors to the Selfie City display can introduce filters and criteria and observe uh, patterns and trends. Fan fact, Moscow had by far the highest proportion of female selfie takers. 82% of them were women. And that is what is trending today. Well, it's been an exciting week in sports. For all of the highlights, we turn to Sonny Young with the sunny side of sports. Sonny. Hi, Vincent. And sporty greetings once again to our Africa 54 viewers. New York City is known as one of the big melting pots here in the United States. People from all over the world live in New York, attracted to its vibrant arts, entertainment, business, and yes, sports scenes. The Long Island University men's basketball team in New York symbolizes the city's multicultural nature. It has players from Iceland, the Netherlands, Nigeria, Senegal, and Central African Republic. VOA's Bernard Schussman tells us more about the team. The team is the Blackbirds. They play in the Northeast Conference that has 21 foreign-born players, five of them at LIU. 20-year-old Nura Zana is from Nigeria. His goal is to play in the National Basketball Association, the top basketball league in the world. 
But Santa knows there's more to basketball than playing the game. Hopefully, you know, if I can get uh, like a job in the NBA, like an international uh, uh, department job, so you know uh, we can more we can help uh, basketball more global, you know, in Africa, and uh, and uh, promote the game more in Africa, and you know, help more kids. One of his teammates is Glenn Fedanga. This 21-year-old college junior is from the Central African Republic. Like a lot of kids in Africa, they're dreaming to come here, but they're not lucky enough to get a chance to come. But I was one of the lucky ones to get a chance to come to the United States. One of the youngest players on the team is 18-year-old Ganlandu Sise. He's from Senegal. His goal is to play professionally in Europe. Sise is learning to be independent. Like college is a lot of, a lot of different new things. Like you have to manage your time your school, your work, basketball court. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. So I'm handling it right now. Get your head home run first. Jack Perry has been LIU's head coach for four years. He believes strongly in gathering information about possible basketball recruits, no matter where they're from. And obviously, you want to get a kid that's athletic, that, that, has, all the, that has potential on the basketball court. Uh, but we also look at other things, how they handle adversity. Uh, you, know, are they, you know, are they constantly whining and complaining or making excuses, that kind of stuff on the court? Um, you know, how do they handle, you know, how do they handle situations with their parents, um, you know, teachers and things like that? Elmar Fredrickson, top of the key, works at the Three out of the last five years, the Blackbirds have been champions of their conference. Perry believes his international team is on track to achieve some of the same glory that LIU has enjoyed in its past basketball history. He's going to fire it now for three. Good! Bernard Schussman, VOA News, Brooklyn, New York. We heard Nigerian player Nurazana say his goal is to play in the NBA in Bernard's report. Here's a sunny side of sports salute to the NBA's hottest team, the Golden State Warriors. Led by number 30 in white, sharp shooting guard Stephen Curry, the defending champion Warriors, based in Northern California, have won a record 20 games in a row to start the season. Curry fired in 40 points Wednesday night in a 116 to 99 road victory over the Charlotte Hornets, and he played only three quarters. Curry was awarded the league's most valuable player trophy last season, and he's showing this season it wasn't a fluke as the Warriors have rolled to the best start in NBA history. They'll uh, go after number 21 wins in a row this weekend in Canada where they play the Toronto Raptors. I'm VOA Sonny Young, and that's the sunny side of sports. Going to send the ball back to Vincent McCoury. Thank you very much, Sonny. And watch for the sunny side of sports every Monday and Friday right here on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching from all of us here in Washington. Have a good night.